Emojis are like memes in, the, in that they express something that can't really be expressed through simple words. The organization behind the propagation of emojis is called the Unicode Consortium. This organization approves which symbols are to be added to the official symbol table present within most digital electronics. Unicode, made up of a group of companies that have stakes in what symbols are used in electronics. Unicode's top members hold most of the voting rights and include companies you'd expect like Facebook, Google, Adobe, Apple, Netflix, the Sultanate of Oman's Religious Affairs Division, Microsoft, wait a second, the Sultanate of Oman's Religious Affairs Division? <laughs> Why would the Sultanate of Oman's Religious Affairs Division care enough about the various types of symbols used in electronic text to become a top member of the Unicode Consortium, on the same level as global tech companies like Microsoft and Google? See the King James Bible, 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. It describes a deal struck between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Verse 1. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove, prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all of her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he met, he went up unto the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, it was a true report that I had. I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit, I believe not that the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told to me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. It sounds like the queen had some secret knowledge, and she wanted to determine if King Solomon also had this knowledge. The result sounds as though King Solomon proves to have even greater knowledge than she does. But knowledge concerning what? There is a book that was published around 1650 entitled The Lesser Key of Solomon, Ars Goetia. The book claims to have been written by King Solomon himself. And the first section of the book contains instructions for summoning each of the 72 demons with the use of a magical seal and by uttering the demon's name. Verse 10. And she gave the king a 120 talents of gold and of spices very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Verse 13. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatever, whatsoever she asked, besides that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So the queen of Sheba gives King Solomon gold, spices, and precious stones. And in return, King Solomon gives the queen all her desire, whatsoever she asked, and his royal bounty. What does that mean? What did, the, what did King Solomon give the queen in exchange for gold, spices, and precious stones? Is it possible that what King Solomon traded to the Queen of Sheba was the 72 original demonic seals? Fast forward to 1955, where a young American archaeologist named Wendell Phillips began an expedition to unearth the holdings of the Queen of Sheba. These included archaeological sites in Yemen and, you guessed it, Oman. Kataban and Sheba, ancient kingdoms of Arabia. This 1950s film follows the quest to rediscover the capitals of the spice trade. The expedition was led by a brilliant young archaeologist seen here on the right. Wendell Phillips, just 28, gathered a team of international experts and with armed guards set off for Yemen. It was our responsibility to guard our security throughout the interior for we were the first party of Americans to ever make this journey and through much of the area that we were to cross, we were the first party of Europeans of any kind. Over the next few years and through many adventures, the expedition excavated several important sites. Ancient treasures were found, many of which are on display for the first time. But most importantly, the team established new timelines for Arabian history that remain the reference for researchers today. None of it could have happened without Wendell Phillips. He's the person who inspires. And it's quite clear that he's able to coordinate the support, but at the same time coordinate some really great archaeologists. And I think it's that combination that makes him such a, a great figure. One of the highlights is this alabaster head, nicknamed Miriam. I was once offered $100,000 for this head and I refused to sell it. Miriam with blue lapis lazuli eyes, a dimple in her chin, cautery incision marks on each cheek, 
an Egyptian style hairdo, holes for a necklace, and only the tip of Miriam's nose missing. Miriam was also the treasured possession of Phillips's sister, who continues his work today and gave much of his collection to the Smithsonian. We had her in our house, and it was always so, you know, why do we have all these things, Mama? Because your brothers excavated them. Everything that you see here when we initiated our expeditions was initially under the ground, and it was a thrill to walk through the streets where no one had walked for over 2,000 years. Wendell Phillips had to abandon his excavations because of tribal hostilities. He and his team were forced to flee across the desert and only just managed to escape. The local superstitious tribesmen tried to expel the intruder, eventually going so far as to raid his camp and abduct hostages. But something eventually caused them to reverse course on him. Ultimately, Phillips became one of the first Westerners ever to become a tribal sheik. Could it be that Phillips uncovered the original seals given to the Queen of Sheba? Just as we have no clear record in our sources of what Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba, so we do not know what Phillips gave to the Sultanate of Oman. But we do know how Phillips was compensated according to his New York Times obituary. Soon after Phillips' unearthing of the Queen of Sheba's palace within the country of Oman, he was granted enormous concessions by the Omani government, enough to make him the world's largest individual holder of oil concessions at the time. Unicode 8 was released in the same year the Omani government joined the Unicode Consortium. This version included the last 12 of the 72 core face emojis, the same number as the number of demonic seals in the lesser keys of King Solomon. The actual version of the emojis published by Unicode is the black and white versions, which are much closer to the original seals than the cartoonized, fully rendered versions available on devices today. The Omani government's religious affairs division likely created some kind of correspondence between the 72 lesser keys and the 72 face emojis. Dizzy face is Marbus. Look of triumph is Baal. Nerd face is Malthus. Thoughtful face is Halphus. And I'll list the rest on the screen. Recently, I came across an image showing the scribble-like script used by doctors when given, giving prescriptions. I thought, that's odd. Wait, that kind of looks weird. Wait, that reminds me of another scribble-looking script. And it was the sigils of the 72 lesser keys of King Solomon. Some of these doctor prescription drug or diagnose scribbles kind of fit with the sigils and the emojis. Now, what I'm suggesting is perhaps doctors are unknowingly writing seals for demons. They're, they're prescribing a demon to someone. And I'll get, I'll get back to that. First off, let's talk about demons. Jerry Marzinski was a licensed psych psychiatrist who counseled hundreds of paranoid schizophrenics over 35 years while working at, at a max security prison. He has some fascinating stories. Uh, definitely check out his channel. He, he makes an excellent case that most negative thoughts are de demonic, spiritual, or et etheric entities. I started studying the voices uh, you know, maybe 35 years ago, and, and they're not what psychiatry says they are. Mm -hmm. you know, first of all, I noticed they ran patterns. <clears throat> you know, they spoke in complete sentences. They spoke with uh, complete thoughts, but these were all nasty, evil thoughts. I mean, nothing was good about them. They were consistently negative. Uh, they were anti-religious. Now, now, the psychiatric mafia insists that these things are hallucinations. They haven't done a single study on the voices. I mean, who's going to study a hallucination? Except they don't fit the pattern of a hallucination. Hallucinations are random. They're all over the place. They're positive. They're negative. They're neutral. They're all over the place. The voices run consistent, persistent patterns. And you can see those. Anybody who works with schizophrenics, anybody who has a schizophrenic family member can see these patterns themselves. And if they're running patterns, they're not hallucinations. And, and two of the most uh, prevalent are, they're negative. And it's one of the first things I noticed when I was working at this huge state hospital I started working at. Uh, there were 10,000 patients there when I got there. Mm -hmm. The place was the size of a small city. The voices, first of all, they, you know, they don't teach you anything about the voices in psychology or psychiatry because they don't know anything about them. They haven't studied them. They haven't spent any time studying them or looking at them. You know, the, the psychiatric mafia had just go, hey, we're the head of mental health. We hereby uh, pronounce that the voices are hallucinations because we said so. That's a bunch of bull. You know, if they run patterns, they can't be hallucinations. And two of the most prevalent patterns are negativity. They're consistently negative. They don't hardly say anything positive. And if they do, it's only to, to get the person and, and gig them, to get them to believe what they're saying. They're consistent liars. They're persistent liars. They lie about everything. You can't believe anything they say. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when I first got onto the front lines, because of the little we were taught about the voices, they said, oh, well, they're hallucinations. So I just assumed they were like uh, word salad, that they were all over the place, that they made no sense. They were just babble. That's far from the truth. They speak in complete sentences with complete ideas, and those ideas are, are very negative and dangerous. They, they're constantly attacking the person who is hosting them, and they're attacking anybody who tries to help them. 
they're consistently anti-religious. One of the first things I saw at the, at the state hospital is one of the patients told me that when they repeated the 23rd Psalm, their voices reacted like um, worms thrown onto a hot frying pan. Now, what kind of hallucination would care about the 23rd Psalm? You know, why would a hallucination just be negative? What, what holds it on a negative pattern? You know, these things are consistently negative. Why isn't it all over the place like real hallucinations? Why aren't they sometimes negative? Why aren't they sometimes positive? Uh, why aren't they sometimes negative? Why aren't they all over the place like real hallucinations? No, they're consistently negative. You know. Yeah. So I'm curious. <clears throat> I've heard your other. I've listened to quite a few of your talks, and I'd be curious in your own mind how how did it evolve for you, right? So I know first you went through the training, you started working with patients. At which point did you have kind of an inkling that hey, maybe the model that we've been told isn't exactly the full picture. Well, that was only after I got onto the front lines, you know, past all the educational BS and the brainwashing that they put us through as far as what psychology is and what the mind is and, and what counseling should be. You know, it was only, I mean, you look, at, look at how they hold people out from studying mental illness. In my entire 45 years on the front lines, working virtually every kind of psychiatric institution in the United States and spending the last 10 years of my formal uh, employment, working psychiatric crisis in big hospitals across Tucson. I have never, ever seen a researcher on the front lines, ever. And I've worked in a lot of institutions for many, many years. I've never seen a researcher on the front lines. They will not allow them on. You know, you try to get, you try to get a, a, a permission to do some research in a psych hospital. Oh no, it's too dangerous. We can't uh, uh, we can't risk you being hurt. Uh, same thing with the prisons. You know, when we had a visitor at the prison, they they were especially a legislature. They were surrounded by by Department of Corrections staff, so they couldn't talk to the inmates. They couldn't talk to the staff. Mm. They wouldn't let them communicate with the people in there. Now, everything looked fine, both in the state hospital. You look at the grounds. They were beautiful, manicured. The outside of the buildings looked fine. But you get inside, and it was a, it was a, it was a hell. It, 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 some of those buildings were just absolute psychiatric hell. Yeah. You know? And they, they would just drug these people senseless just to keep them under control. Same thing with the prison. You walk into the prison, you won't see a cigarette butt anywhere. If, somebody, if one of the inmates throws a cigarette butt on the ground, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> it's not permitted. You do not trash it. It looks pristine from the outside to fool the public. But on the inside, it's, it's a can of worms. Same way with the psychiatric institutions. You know? So they will not allow researchers into these institutions to take a look at what's really going on. All the research comes from the drug company-controlled educational institutions. And believe me, they are controlled by the drug companies. They're controlled by big pharma. Virtually nothing gets published unless big pharma gives it the okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets funded unless big pharma funds it. You know, if, if an institution starts putting out too much stuff that goes against what they, they want to <laughs> out there, they'll cut off their funding. Yep. So the, the United States uh, uh, medical system was taken over in like 1910 by Rockefeller and the Carnegie Foundation. They, they bought off Congress to write a law that no um, graduate school could graduate doctors unless they, that they came from a university that taught pharmacology or pharmacological medicine. Right. So right away, they cut off all other forms of medication, uh, medicine. You know, um, when I say demonic, I'm referring to the computer term daemon used to describe a background process. If you use a Windows operating system, open your task manager. Notice all the processes running in the background. Not every computer background process is, is malicious. Most are just collecting information and data. Some are actually useful. Some are indeed malicious, though. It's highly likely you have experienced these demonic entities in some way. Sometimes it's subtle, like the little voice in your head that gets awfully chatty whenever you start working out after not doing so for a long period of time. Other times, it's particularly vile random thought that will pop into your head even though you never act upon it or ever normally think that vile thought. Bill Burr had a great <laughs> comedic bit about this. You ever drive down the street and see like 30 people up on a sidewalk and you just think, <laughs> you don't do it, you just think it. That's what's like separates the psychos from the functioning psychos, right? Psychos, they just think it, fuck it, they do it. <laughs> But as a functioning psycho, not only do you not do it, you actually analyze it. Like, man, if I just leave my hand right here, nobody knows who I am. I move it two degrees over here. I'm on the cover of Newsweek. I am instantly famous, right? Right here, nobody knows me. Just a regular jackass. Like, hey, Bill, you want to come to the cookout? You know, one of the most horrific scenes we've seen in years. But it's just screwed about. Anyway, my point is perhaps doctors slowly become more and more bombarded by these de demonic entities that by the time they can write prescriptions, their entire being identifies with that of the demonic puppeteer. As a result, they begin writing in a demonic script. Why do prescriptions require a doctor's physical handwriting and signature? Why not use a, a digital uh, signature or a digital script, right? And I, I, I figured that, that the reason they do this is because it's, much, it's much, much more difficult to fake a handwritten prescription than to fake a digital prescription 
At least that's what that's what I thought. Um, if you do it digitally, then like really all you need is a computer and a printer, and any drug addict could could uh, easily fake a prescription and signature with a, a printer and a computer. Uh, but if it's handwritten, then it makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think that I, I'm guessing that's the reason, but that doesn't really that doesn't seem like a valid reason to not go fully digital with that. Like, what what is the significance of them using their physical handwritten signature and physical handwritten prescription? Uh, I have a few theories, but the one most relevant to this topic is that handwritten prescriptions from a licensed doctor are actual demonic sigils, and the act of submitting the prescription to the pharmacy activates the demonic sigil effectively attaching a, de- a demon to the patient. And it, it's all consent-based. If, the, if the, the patient submits the sigil, they're giving consent to it. Think about, also, think about na- the names of most drugs. They literally sound like the names for demons, right? Dextromethorphan, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, pseudofedrogene, fexophenidine. If you didn't know they were the names for drugs, you'd likely not be surprised if they were the names of demons, right? Those are just the over-the-counter drug names. Prescribed drug names are arguably sound even more so like the names of demons. Lopressor, like suppressor, I don't know. Uh, Zestral, glucophage, Norvasc, etc. Like who comes up with these names? Why are they using these weird names for these drugs, these prescribed drugs? They can name them anything, right? The act of accepting the handwritten prescription, traveling to a pharmacy, and then submitting the prescription is tacit consent to having the demonic entity attached to you. Remember, demons are like background processes. Most are simply collecting information or signaling some might be useful and relieve the user of their, sim- their symptoms or ailments. Some are malicious and may give the user more ailments. See side effects. The side effects are the effects. There's no such thing as side effects. If it's an effect, it's an effect. How would this be useful? Imagine having access to the mental and physical health of every single human on Earth. Most demonic background processes are simply collecting information and data, allegedly. I surmise that demonic forces use doctors' handwritten prescriptions as a massive intelligence network that they likely use to influence humans at the highest levels of power in this realm. For example, if you found out the Pope was getting prescribed a drug, aka a daemon, or background process, to treat a sexually transmitted disease, then you know the Pope is likely breaking his vow of celibacy with sexual deviance. That's very useful information to know if one wanted to influence the Pope and therefore the entire Catholic Church. Expand that out to every world leader, military general, politician, banker, committee, etc. That's a tremendous amount of power and influence over people. The Sultanate of Oman's Religious Affairs Division likely uses emojis in a similar way, but perhaps with less private health information and more overall data and information. Perhaps each use of an emoji opens a one-way looking glass portal that the, that the demonic entity can see out. Who knows? It could be that the emojis are being used for some other reason. And I get this, that this whole topic sounds outlandish, but, but so does King Solomon's 72 lesser demonic key signals clearly and obviously getting represented by the 72 face emojis. Also, why else would the Sultan of Oman's Religious Affairs Division be a top member for the Unicode Consortium along with companies like Adobe, Microsoft, Apple, Google, etc. that governs all computer fonts and text? There is no other reason I can think of, but feel free to present your theory in the comments if you think it, there's a, a logical reason for it. A part of me believes demons are like background processes. And another part of me believes that, and the other part of me believes that almost all demonic voices are negative, while there are many other different spirits, most neutral and some good. Hope you enjoyed the video.